You know, licensed games are kind of viewed as the rascal of the video game industry. Like, you take one look at Shrek Extra Large and right away you know what you're in for. So yeah, it's pretty widely accepted that licensed games are nothing more than a quick cash grab to capitalize on fans of a movie or TV show. But that's not always the case. There's quite a few hidden gems out there when it comes to licensed games. Uh, Simpsons Hit and Run, Cards the Video Game, GoldenEye, and of course, Battle for Bikini Bottom. Now, out of all those games, Battle for Bikini Bottom was the only one I never got to play as a kid. I remember the commercial for it would play all the time on Nickelodeon, though, and it made the game look so extreme and cool, and, and yeah, it, it was just a SpongeBob game, but it, it was the early 2000s. C commercials like this just kind of worked back then. <laughs> The battle for Bikini Bottom in 15 seconds! Bikini Bottom was a lovely place, but now it isn't! The evil plankton has taken it over! SpongeBob has to say that that's him tongue boarding! Why is he doing that? Can't get into that now. It's a new SpongeBob video game, and it's on a bunch of different game systems, and it's rated everywhere. So, I mean, of course, I had to go ask my parents for the game, but they went and pulled the whole, but we already got a SpongeBob game uh, thing on me. And I mean, yeah, we did, but. It was this one. Now, at the time, I was fine with that. I really enjoyed the game. It had all the characters and locations from the show, and the gameplay was pretty fun from what I remember. But then I got older, and the whole internet thing started to become a big part of my life, and I found out pretty quickly that not too many people felt the same way about this game as I did. For a lot of people, Revenge of the Flying Dutchman is viewed as one of the worst licensed games of all time, and Battle for Bikini Bottom, which came out at around the same same time is viewed as one of the best licensed games of all time. It even got an HD remake in 2020. Revenge of the Flying Dutchman didn't get an HD remake. So what happened here? Did my rose-tinted nostalgia glasses get the better of me? Is Revenge of the Flying Dutchman actually a terrible game? Or are people just being too hard on it? I mean, it can't be that bad, right? These were both good games. Well, let's take a look back at Revenge of the Flying Dutchman and see if this game really is as bad as people say it is. So, th before we start, a little background. Starting in the 1990s and going all the way up to the early 2010s, a company you may have heard of called THQ held the exclusive rights to create and publish games based on Nickelodeon shows. This, of course, included SpongeBob SquarePants. Now, how it usually worked is THQ would contract other studios to create the actual games, and THQ would just fund the development costs. In the early 2000s, a fairly new studio called Big Sky Interactive won the contract to create a game based on the then upcoming Jimmy Neutron movie. But as they were working on that game, they heard THQ was also looking for a studio to create a new Spongebob game. Big Sky quickly jumped on the opportunity and surprisingly convinced THQ to give them the contract for this new Spongebob game as well. That's pretty impressive. I mean, like I said, Big Sky Interactive was a pretty new studio at the time. The Jimmy Neutron game was really their only project they had under their belt, so for THQ to trust them with one of Nickelodeon's biggest IPs is pretty impressive. I, I wonder what kind of games they're working on nowadays. <laughs> So, yeah, there's a lot of people out there that assume Revenge of the Flying Dutchman was so bad that it put Big Sky Interactive out of business, but that's actually not true. Thanks to a YouTuber that goes by the name Who Needs Normal, we now know the real reason why Big Sky went belly up. I recommend checking out their video for the full story, but basically, at some point during Revenge of the Flying Dutchman's development, THQ offered to buy Big Sky Interactive. Big Sky refused, so apparently THQ THQ got pissed and blacklisted Big Sky, which prevented them from getting any future work. Yeah, it's kind of messed up and sad, really. Uh, apparently, towards the end of development, their funding had all but dried up. However, instead of canceling the game right before their deadline, they decided to finish the project with little to no pay. It just kind of shows how passionate they were about their work, and I think that's super commendable. Uh, but anyways, let's get on to the actual game.
We start with this pretty neat interactive menu, complete with Mr. Krabs and Squidward talking shit behind SpongeBob's back. It's honestly pretty charming though. I mean, you usually don't see this kind of care put into a main menu of all things, especially when it comes to licensed games. From the main menu, you can start a new game, load a game, or access the options and extras, which I, I guess we should get the extras out of the way first. You don't really have much in the way of extras. There's just the credits, a slideshow of concept art from the show, and uh, uh, hints and tips video, which they're they're not really hints and tips. They're more so just showing you random stuff you can do in the game. But like, what's up with this squished ass SpongeBob? Anyways, though, the actual game starts with SpongeBob having a nightmare about the Krusty Krab closing down. And then he plays fetch with Gary, and somewhere along the way, they find a bottle that has the Dutchman trapped inside. So I gotta take you with me. Are you ready? Hold on there, Mr. Dutchman, sir. Uh, technically speaking, it was not me who found you. Gary's the one who dug you up. Wow, way to, way to just out Gary like that. So the Dutchman kidnaps Gary. And then he kidnaps all SpongeBob's friends. But of course, it's up to you to get them all back. To do this, you need to collect all the Dutchman's lost treasures. Each of the seven worlds has one of the Dutchman's treasures in it. But to make the treasure appear, you'll have to collect nine letter tiles, which spell out SpongeBob's name. You get these letter tiles by doing random missions in each of the worlds. So yeah, not too different from something like Mario 64 or Sunshine. The first world is Bikini Bottom, which also acts as the tutorial and hub world for the game. You'll be introduced to all the main mechanics here, like jumping, hovering, and attacking. Uh, honestly, everything controls fairly well for the most part. The jumping feels decent enough, and the hovering ability makes it so you can always correct a mistimed jump. There's also a crouch jump that can be used to reach higher platforms. Eventually though, you'll come across a changing tent. Here you can change into one of the three unlockable costumes, each of which gives you a different ability. You'll start out with the jellyfishing gear, which you can use to catch jellyfish and grab onto hooks. Later on though, you'll you'll unlock the Mermaid Man costume, which allows you to throw projectiles, and the Reef Blower, which lets you bl blow th things. But once you find all the letter tiles in Bikini Bottom, or any world for that matter, you'll solve one of those slider puzzle things to get a clue on where the Dutchman's treasure is hidden. And then you'll use a dowsing rod to actually find the treasure, and that's basically what you'll be doing throughout the entire game. After Bikini Bottom is finished though, we meet up with Squidward and race him to the Krusty Krab, and he just kind of walks the entire race. <laughs> So we talk with Mr. Krabs and hey, that, they, they actually got Mr. Krabs' real voice actor for this game. Uh, that's not something Battle for Bikini Bottom could save, so score one for this game. But Mr. Krabs tells us the Krusty Krab has been seeing fewer customers lately and they need to figure out a way to drum up more business. So they decide to offer delivery in downtown Bikini Bottom, which just so happens to be the second world of the game. So we go downtown, deliver a few Krabby Patties, go to a nearby construction site, do the same, and then we get to the high rise apartments. This place blows. It's basically a huge vertical platforming section, and it definitely makes me reconsider that thing I said like a minute and 43 seconds ago about the controls being fine. You have to make a lot of really tight jumps to get anywhere. Now, that would normally be a problem, except you can't move the camera here, which makes it extremely difficult to judge how far a jump really is. But after you finish Downtown Bikini Bottom, the game kind of opens up a bit. You can either choose to go to Jellyfish Fields or Sandy Street... I guess we're doing Sandy first. So Sandy comes busting in looking for a fight. We fight her, except not really. We just kind of break a bunch of stuff together. And then she somehow busts a bunch of holes in her tree dome while practicing karate. You'd think she'd stop after the, making the first hole. So we plug up the holes with some acorns and you give Sandy an acorn in a jar, which turns out to be a wasp's nest, I guess. And then you have to catch all the wasps that escape. I, I don't know, man. A lot happens at this level, but you know what? It makes Sandy Street Home a pretty memorable area in this game, and I actually enjoyed it quite a bit. Now, Jellyfish Fields, on the other hand, is... It's, it's kind of bad. 
Wanna know why? It takes 100 jellyfish to win this competition, Sonny. No! Jellyfish fields is so unnecessarily big, and you need to catch pretty much every jellyfish here to win this stupid jellyfishing competition. But, but guess what? There aren't even 100 jellyfish in jellyfish fields. So you need to backtrack to all the past areas and catch all the jellyfish there too, and just... This whole section feels so unnecessary, like, like, maybe it wouldn't have been so bad if you only had to catch like half the amount of jellyfish, like 50 or something. Not even for 50 jellyfish! Oh, don't worry, we'll get to you. Next up is Chum World, which is probably my favorite area. It's just a big amusement park that has actual mini games to play. And not a sign and say good mini games. I just find the whole amusement park thing to be kind of charming, but of course they had to go and ruin it with... <laughs> Chum putt. So, do you like mini golf? Don't answer that because I can't hear you. The point is, this thing blows. But with Chum World out of the way, we can finally move on to Google. Wait, what? what is that, Larry? Is that fucking Larry? He looks like a nervous little kid waiting for the bus on his first day of school or something. What the, what the hell does Larry want? Son of a. So you gotta backtrack through all the past areas again to catch Larry 50 jellyfish. Well, maybe for 50 jellyfish. Yeah, I heard you the first time there, champ. But after all that, though, we finally get to go to Goo Lagoon. Now, the whole thing with this area is you gotta keep harassing Larry in hopes that he'll give you the letter tile that's attached to his belt. So you harass him a few times on the beach and... Oh shit, Larry's had enough, yo! Let's, what is this, the final boss or something? I'm, I'm ready, let's go, let's kick Larry's ass! Maybe I can hide at that old shipwreck. What the hell is all that about? So we challenge Larry to see who can break the most stuff on a pirate ship, he gives us the letter tile, then the Dutchman crashes his boat into a pier, killing millions, and, and yeah, that's... That's Goo Lagoon, I guess. The final area is the Dutchman's graveyard, and the whole thing is one big butt joke. Be ya here to steal my booty? Oh, believe me, I have no interest in touching your booty. After all the booty stuff, you fight the Dutchman in the most underwhelming boss fight ever, save your friends, roll credits, and that's the game. Nice going, SpongeBob! So, with the game finally finished, uh, how do I feel about it now? Did nostalgia get the better of me? Is Revenge of the Flying Dutchman actually as bad as everyone says it is? Or were my childhood memories right and this game actually isn't that bad? I mean, like, it's all right, I guess. Like, I don't know, this game isn't completely unredeemable. There are some things that I still enjoyed about it even now. It's just got this weird charm to it. Like, the writing is pretty terrible, but because they got all the voice actors to reprise their roles, it still has that Spongebob charm to it. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't know, man. Like, I feel like it's at least somewhat as enjoyable as Battle for Bikini Bottom, which, which hey, I, I've been keeping score this whole time, so let, let's see how well this game compares to Battle for Bikini Bottom. Oh, God damn it, really? <laughs>